Good afternoon, everyone. This is the Daily Friend Show, and I'll be your host today, uh, St uh, Terence Corrigan, standing in for the inestimable Nicholas Lorimer, who is now somewhere between Washington, D.C. and New Orleans, um, probably enjoying the state of the RAND. Um, with me today are uh, John Endress, our CEO. John, how are you doing this uh, fine, if somewhat chilly day? Yeah, it's freezing. But uh, the sun is out, and as long as the sun is shining, then we're happy. Thanks, Terence. Yeah, well, uh, as Ian Crookshank always used to say, the sun is shining. Uh, and uh, also is the um, the uh, the Lion of Boxburg, Marius Ruet. I'm from Benoni, Terence. Don't uh, oh, sorry, Benoni, Boxburg, yeah. you know, potato, Jeez, potato. Like... Yes, it's like saying to a South African, they actually, uh, I don't know, Australian or something. You know? <laughs> that, was, that was deliberate, by the way. Uh, yes. <laughs> How are you doing today? Right on you, Terence. Hello, John. Yeah, hello. Okay. You know, well, let's jump right into it. Uh, well, there have been a couple of um, a couple of interesting moves and shakes in, our, um, in the demented South, equally demented politics. One of the more interesting of which is that the ANC in the Western Cape seems finally um, uh, about to re-elect um, a leadership, something that's been lacking for about five years. Um, let me uh, uh, let me start with with with, Mar with Marius. You are our resident um, uh, our resident commentator, and the guy who probably knows more about uh, about the party dynamics of this country than any of the rest of us. What do you make of this? Is the ANC back in the fight? Uh, yeah, I don't think so. Uh, the ANC is pretty much dead in the Western Cape, I think. Uh, I think if uh, the it's, say the Western Cape was independent and it had the same party politics dynamics, I think the ANC probably wouldn't even exist in the uh, Western Cape anymore. I think the only reason it's still even uh, around is because uh, of it's part of a, a you know big organisation in the rest of the country. And we've actually seen, I mean, th I mean, this is a pattern that could happen to the ANC in the rest of the country one day, I think, actually. So the ANC has gone from being the biggest party in uh, the province. It's, uh, I think its best ever election results was in 2004. It got 45% of the vote. And it's now uh, in the last uh, provincial election in um, the Western Cape, it got high 20s or low 30s, I think. And in the local government election at the end of, uh, or the beginning of November 2021, it barely got 20% of the vote. So, you know, it's a party that's, really nowhere it's uh you know it's i mean i wouldn't rule it like, i don't think you can say it'll never ever come back to power in the western cape but i think it'd be a very difficult task for the western cape ANC to get there and it also just shows you the fact that there hasn't been any kind of uh provincial congress in for the ANC in the province for five years or whatever it is is that the party is really nowhere and it's uh yeah it's um I think almost at the end of the road for the province uh, for the party in the Western Cape. But what I think is an interesting little dynamic is one of the front runners who's running to be the provincial chairperson of the uh, ANC in the Western Cape is Cameron Dugmore, who, if he wins, will become uh, probably the highest ranking uh, white person in the ANC. And I think it also, yeah, I mean, then, then maybe the, all the barbs at the ANC about them uh, not being all that representative of uh, South African demographics we might have to rethink it. But I do think that is an interesting dynamic if Cameron Blackmore does manage to get the leadership position there. And he is probably the most uh, prominent uh, ANC politician in the Western Cape at the moment. It seems to me from what you um, uh, from what you're saying that we're talking about the state of the of, of the ANC as an institution. And of course, this comes just on top of the uh, formal departure, expulsion, call it what you will, because we're never quite sure of these things, of their former Secretary General, Ace Mokashule. Um, John, what's your what's your take on this? This, I understand, is the first time the ANC has ever, has ever expelled a, um, a, a, a Secretary General. And these people have historically occupied a, you know, a position of respect, which is not always accorded to the, to, to the actual president. Yeah, it's a... Uh quite hard to get a, a sense of what you've got to do to, to get kicked out of the ANC. I think that's that's hard to engineer. Um, but if you do manage it, it makes you a member in one of the most exclusive clubs in the world, which is very few members. Um, and Esma Hashule, he's been embroiled in that asbestos uh, scandal in the Free State, I think 250, 255 million rand is no. the total value of that, of that case. Um, so he's been in a, out of court quite a lot, uh, ultimately was suspended as Secretary General of the 
ANC, but I think he was not suspended for corruption or being implicated in corruption, but rather for misconduct because he mm. uh, spoke out against the ANC and especially against Cyril Ramaphosa. So he did not uh, uh, observe good form. He was critical of the leadership. And that is ultimately, ultimately what led to him getting kicked out. Um, it is quite amusing to see some of the comments on, on his expulsion, amongst others from Batabili Dlamini, uh, who said, you know, sure, you know, sometimes I guess you have to kick people out of the party. But really, this was so precipitate action. It was too rushed. It was too fast. You know, they, they surely should have given him some more time. But it's been years already um, with, with very little action. So um, I think it just reflects on the party's approach to uh, discontent, to corruption, to underperformance, which is that you just let it run and run and run, Terence. Well, yeah, I, my, my own sense of it is that uh, going right back into the 1990s, it is the disruption of the party's uh, nominal unity rather than uh, the actions of its um, uh, of its cadres deployed um, with access to the public purse that seems to be uh, the defining um, uh, the defining feature as to whether one is acceptable or not and I think uh, very definitely what does not seem to fe uh, uh, to feature is whether someone breaches the uh, uh, the party's nominal um, uh, nominal values as Morris think po uh, pointed out quite correctly, we have a situation where um, a party that has um, uh, that has been at the forefront of demanding uh, demographic representativity simply can't match that in its own ranks. I must say, you know, to to to, to give the ANC its due, uh, 1994 it was very very um, uh, it was very strongly focused on that uh, to the point that I remember that they put Penny Haynes on their electoral list. Uh, without her <laughs> consent. Um, for, for the younger viewers, uh, Terence, who is Penny Haynes? She was a, a, a she was a formidable South African athlete at the time. I well, I think this was like a nomination. Um, mm. But uh, the caucus in the um, in the first parliament actually was, uh, you know, to use a dreadful phrase that we've come to be associated with, uh, it was not demographically representative in the sense that uh, uh, white people and Indians uh, were uh, disproportionately represented in the ANC benches. Uh, this is uh, less so the case now, and. Um, those who remember 2009 and the criticism of Helen Zilla's cabinet in the Western Cape, it was pointed out at the time, because uh, it was entirely male, uh, apart from herself, that uh, I think there were four provincial executive councils in which there was there, there was not a single um, uh, a single member who was not what you might describe as an ethnic African. Uh, Ferial Huffergy actually pointed that out. Um, Marius, your your take on the on the Magashuli situation. I just want to point out, I think, uh, what you're saying about uh, what it takes to get uh, kicked out of the ANC. Just thinking back to the 1990s as well, Bantola Misa was kicked out of the ANC in mm. 98 or so, or 97, and he right. was kicked out for pointing out corruption. Not for actually doing anything. He he was he was kicked out for bringing the party into disrepute for saying that Stella Sikau, who had been uh, was a cabinet minister at the time, but had been the prime minister of the trans I think, before the transition, she'd been... Um, accused of uh, receiving bribes, I think from uh, I'm not I'm, I'm able to correction from, uh, under this, but from Sol Kersner, maybe or somebody else. But anyway, so this, that was why Bantolomisi was kicked out, not for anything he'd actually done, but for saying that uh, a fellow um, ANC cabinet minister had been receiving bribes. So uh, this is all. Um, I think I mean Ace, we we all knew this was coming. Ace Magashule was going to get kicked out, and it's been a long time coming. It'll be interesting mm -hmm. to see what he does next. He's always had um, a, quite a strong base in the Free State. Uh, you know, he kind of controlled uh, the free state and uh, ANC free state as a personal fiefdom. Uh, I think he'd been the chair of the uh, party in the province since uh, 1994, but he only became premier when uh, Jacob Zuma became president. I don't think he'd been, uh, uh, I don't think he really got on with the uh, ANC national leadership before that with Nelson Mandela and Thabo Mbeki and all that kind of thing. So it'll be interesting to see where Magashule goes now. He's uh, also been part of the, you know, so-called radical economic uh, transformation faction. So it might be interesting to see if he gets into the orbit of uh, somebody like the um, EFF, something like that. We recently saw Mazwan Nele Mani join the EFF as an MP. He got parachuted in after having been a member of the ATM. Uh, which is kind of another party that uh, looks seems to have links to Jacob Zuma, 
and that kind of faction of the ANC. So yeah, I think the most interesting thing now will be see what happens with Magashule and if he can bring any of his kind of personal sports over with him, which uh, I'm, I'm a bit skeptical of, uh, skeptical of, but it'll be interesting to see what he does next. Indeed. Um, I think that uh, just sort of pivoting slightly, um, there was also an interesting interview given mm -hmm. by, um, uh, by the um, Freedom Front's uh, uh, Peter Krunewald on, um, on Biz News, I believe. Uh, talking about um, uh, talking about that party's uh, uh, predictions for the um, uh, for the coming election or more its approach to the to the coming elections um, about the importance of coalitions and also I think interestingly enough uh, he said that he doesn't think that South Africa would accept a um, would accept a white president John you've um, uh, You've had a lot to say about um, uh, about the uh, about the state of the country. In fact, uh, you were in the in the, the Daily Maverick today. Very interesting article. I encourage everyone to go and um, uh, to go and check it out. And we, as the Institute, have often said that um, a lot of the assumptions about our politics do not actually hold up if you look at if you look at polling. What's your view on this? Uh, in the event of a that moonshot coalition, a phrase he was also quite critical of. We would you, you would need to have a an uh, a racially appropriate leader. Your your take on this? I think that there's two ways to look at this. Um, and I, I, appropriate language used by one of my prof professors in Germany, who would often ask in situations like this. So, are you do you mean this in an empirical sense or a normative sense? Right. And an empirical sense means what actually is the case, and a an normative sense is what should be the case. I think the normative case is very interesting, is, is very simple for us to uh, present, which is that uh, the race should play no role. Uh, the best person should become the president, don't actually care you know, what gender, what race they are. That should be irrelevant. But then the descriptive or empirical side um, is slightly different. Um, so we see in our polling, for example, that about 76% of respondents say that people should be appointed based on merit and not on race. We see that when it comes to sports teams, over 90% of respondents say that sports teams should be appointed on merit, not on race. Is this true for the position of the president? I don't know, uh, because we haven't done the polling on that. I don't know if anybody else has either. And that's why I'm a little bit cautious to endorse the Freedom Front Plus leaders' views here to say, well, everybody knows that you know, a white man could never lead the country. It would simply not be accepted. That sounds like the kind of thing that you believe to be true, but you don't know to be true. And I'd say that until I see some good polling on that, and my dogs start barking, <laughs> um, until we see some polling, I would be skeptical of the claim. Okay. Marius, what's your take? Uh, I agree with John. Uh, and it's something we'd have to see what people do think. Uh, but... We can't pretend that race isn't an issue in uh, South Africa. And I remember when Guy Scott, uh, he became president of Zambia about 10 years ago. And I remember at the time reading some articles and there was a bit of a split uh, in Zambia. Most, most Zambians seem to be considering themselves pretty post-racial and saying, you know, it's not an issue to have a white president. But there were some people who said, you know, we're an African country. You can't have somebody who's not an African, according to these people, white person, can't be African, uh, becoming uh, president of the country. And while Guy Scott, he was actually only the acting president, uh, he, he uh, succeeded a guy called Michael Sata, who died, and Guy Scott's been the vice president. And then when his party, I think it was the, called the Patriotic Front, uh, went to the Congress to elect the, um, you know, the presidential candidate for the next uh, presidential election, Guy Scott declined to stand. I'm not sure if he declined to stand because he thought, you know, as a, maybe it wasn't appropriate as a white guy he shouldn't be standing or whatever the case is, uh, or, you know, he just didn't feel he had a chance to win. But, uh, uh, yeah, I, I think uh, probably a lot of South Africans wouldn't, uh, wouldn't be an issue for them, but I think it could be propaganda in the hands of people who oppose this kind of thing. I can imagine the noise somebody like uh, EFF would be making if a white guy had to become... Uh, you know, president of South Africa. Uh, but also, it wouldn't be the first time that there's a white leader of a post colonial state. Uh, we've also, apart from Guy Scott, we've had Paul Berenger in Mauritius. I think the Prime Minister or President of South uh, Tome and Principe off the coast of uh, uh, West Africa has also had uh, uh, white leaders. So it wouldn't be the first time in Africa, but I think, um, uh, I think it would be quite significant for South Africa to have a white president again. And I think it would 
be you know something quite important symbolically to show that we have moved past a place where I think a lot of people would have thought we couldn't ever get past. And I think it'd be you know something to to look at. But also, as I said, in South Africa, it's, uh, we can't pretend it wouldn't be an issue. But I think we'd have to look at polling and see uh, what voters think if uh, you know a candidate for president uh, is is a white person. Say the moonshot uh, pact's candidate is a white person. See how uh, um, voters and so on react to that. You know, on the on on the Zambian question, I actually um, uh, I spent quite a, quite a lot of time in Zambia over a number of years um, in a former incarnation, and I remember asking people uh, people I, I, I interacted with there, and they all they all seem to regard this as a as a non issue. It's also interesting that um, when uh, there was a big mobilization across the country uh, to oppose Frederick Chaluba's attempt to get a third term. That was spearheaded politically by an MP of Indian extraction. I think maybe the difference is that um, Zambia was never a significant uh, settlement colony, so there are there are racial there, there is a racial racially distinct minority communities, but they were never it it, it was never a major fault line. Um, there's some sort of uh, 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 gripes and hostility about um, about, for instance, uh, uh, Asians owning um, uh, owning shops, but even then, uh, it's a it's a relatively small um, uh, small issue. It's where something can be uh, can be mo uh, mobilized around, even if it's by a comparatively small small group of people, it I think could be could be quite destabilizing, and it's maybe something that the of collective uh, reform-oriented uh, opposition would be would want to steer themselves away from. Um, is, is it not maybe something you would want to create polarization on? We could oh, say, yeah. you know, we, we actually decide that is actually not, you know, in, in the sort of race nationalist camp. Uh, we don't pander to people's racial uh, prejudices. Uh, we'll leave that to the ANC and the EFF, who will be able to, you know, racially transform their leadership elect Cameron Dugmore because they think that a white man must lead the ANC in the Western Cape. A black man would never be accepted. <laughs> you know, right. you go down that road um, and it's, it's uh, not a great road to go down. No, look, uh, you know, I, I, I think that, 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 that this is one of those things where you would need a great, you know, uh, where, where there'd be a great deal of, 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 of toing and froing. Um, you know, if you say, well, a white person couldn't do it, uh, question could a uh, 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 could a brown person do it? Could a could you know, as Rob Hurst likes to say, Gaten McKenzie become <laughs> uh, 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 become president, or would that also be seen as uh, as 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 something as something polarizing? You know, uh, brown people in South Africa are as indigenous as black people, um, but you know, are in some quarters just not seen as being you know black enough or properly black. Um, so. You know, I imagine this is one that 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 would be uh, you know be sort of circling circling around and around. So we we wait to see how that uh, how that pans out. Um, I think moving along, uh, interesting um, interesting developments as we as we head abroad. Uh, Becky Tsele has uh, been doing some um, been doing some police training of uh, in, in information gathering and pointer shopping in China. John, your views. Well, to put the, the most good faith interpretation on this that you possibly can, mm -hmm. yes, South Africa does have a crime problem. Uh, so, you know, we should try to get advice and help and support from wherever we can. So why not China? I know China seems to have a pretty good grip on crime. Uh, so let's send, send a police minister there to get some pointers uh, and introduce whatever technologies and methods are used in China, apply them in South Africa, and we'll live happily ever after. But I think that's probably not quite the interpretation I would, would give it uh, because China famously does surveil its people very, very strictly uh, and has created the kind of state that I find, frankly, terrifying, where mm. uh, you know cameras watch you in public, uh, companies promote their products on the basis that they can identify people who are unfurling a banner and identify them immediately. So, you know, the, the, the police can crack down immediately on anybody who expresses criticism of the government. Or if you look, for example, at the traces of the Tiananmen uprising of 1989, which are being eliminated from libraries in China, from the internet, you can't find out about it. 
Yeah. And this is now where we're sending our police minister to go and, and, and learn his tricks. Not a great idea. Um, and I, I really hope that South Africans are so freedom loving, having liberated themselves in 1994, that they won't go in for this sort of nonsense. And secondly, maybe load shedding will be our salvation because the cameras won't work if there isn't power. Terence. <laughs> Marius, your, uh, your take on this. Is this the prelude to dystopia or is this just another taxpayer funded shindig? Well, some people would argue that we already live in dystopia. If uh, you know, if you're only getting electricity four hours a day and there's no water, and you know there's a crime rate of seventy people getting murdered a day, or whatever the case is, some people would uh, argue already there. But I think that's actually where, uh, so, so like the South African government could uh, bring in some quite authoritarian methods. Uh, I think we saw during COVID, not just in South Africa but around the world where people were very prepared to give up uh, fundamental freedoms and rights because they were worried about what could happen. You know, people were, um, I remember reading that uh, a lot of governments uh, in the West were very surprised how easily people accepted COVID restrictions. And often those restrictions, of, of course, they, they're gone now, but they were in a way indefinite. People didn't know when they were going to end. They could have been extended. And people gave up all kinds of rights that they wouldn't, that you, you'd be surprised they'd give up, you know. Just the right to almost leave your house. I mean, we know in this country that it was illegal to leave your house after midnight for nearly two years. And in the beginning of uh, COVID, uh, you couldn't even leave your house to go for a walk or take your dog for a walk uh, unless it was between certain hours. So I think with something like this, I could see a lot of people who would, uh, you would think would be on the side of freedom and liberty and so on, would be quite happy to give up certain rights and so on and have a camera on every street corner that uh, looks at every license plate and every face if it means we'll start uh, getting a handle on crime so while there is a, is a place for that kind of thing we have seen how these cameras have done in you know the Johannesburg CBD and other parts of Joburg I assume it's also been in uh, other cities around South Africa where it has brought crime down to uh, to some degree uh, I think that you know taking lessons from uh, China and the Chinese Communist Party is definitely something we need to be concerned about. But then all that all said, I do think the CCP is slightly more efficient than the ANC. <laughs> so I don't know if uh, you know the the ANC will get the tender to build a database of everybody's faces to you know Ace Magashule's nephew or whatever case, or maybe not Ace Magashule anymore, but somebody else. And then the, the you know the database will uh, in theory have cost two hundred billion rand and. Uh, WordPress site with 500,000 rand will be built, which doesn't have all the people's faces or can't handle the, you know, the amount of data that has to be kept and so on. So maybe, you know, uh, I think just from that point of view, South Africans can, we'll, we'll probably be okay with, uh, we'll, we'll probably be free for a while thanks to the ANC's incompetence. Well, the, uh, there is a there is a thread that runs through a lot of the kind of nickel and dime corruption, and that is what is spent on technology. Because the promise of technology is always to make things more efficient, but there's but built into that is always the incentive for the vendor to uh, up the prices because of all these efficiencies you're going to get, and then to just make sure there's enough bugs in the system that you can keep on servicing it. Uh, things that have happened in Gauteng really do do, do take the biscuit. Um, and I think going, I think that leads us since we're over, since we're abroad. Let's uh, look at our last story, which is which is in the United States. The pros, uh, a group of lawmakers, both Democrat and Republican, have sent a letter to um, uh, to the uh, uh, Secretary of State of that country, calling for South Africa uh, to be deprived of the uh, the. The host position for the upcoming AGOA summit. Uh, AGOA, of course, being um, the program that gives that gives South African businesses a great deal of uh, uh, tariff-free access into into the very important American market. Um, South Africa has taken certain positions to which the United States has taken umbrage, and uh, well, this seems to suggest that actually uh, this is uh, uh, this. The, this is now reaching some some sort of blowback that goes beyond rhetoric. Um, John, let's start with you. Your take on this? Yeah, so it, it, it looks like um, I think momentum is gathering in the United States uh, in terms of taking action on South Africa. You could see that the unhappiness seems to be mounting over time. Um, there was a letter, I think, from two Republican uh, representatives beginning of the year, congressmen, uh, who were already complaining about South Africa's links to Russia uh, and talking about trade and taking uh, action on that. But I think those were both Republicans. So 
could sort of ignore it and say this is just the opposition making noise for political points. But when you start getting letters which are bipartisan with both of the, the major parties supporting them, then I think you do need to take notice um, right. because it is, it is going mainstream. And what's really interesting is if you look at the uh, AGOA website, the criteria, so it's, it's the president's prerogative to uh, designate sub-Saharan African countries as being eligible uh, if, if he so chooses or she. Mm -hmm. And there are actually quite a few criteria in there. It's not just about you know, behaving nicely in general. You're also meant to establish or make progress towards establishing a market-based economy that protects private property rights. So we are going down the expropriation without compensation route, uh, which is directly contrary, I would argue, mm. to that. You're meant to establish or, con or make progress towards the rule of law and the right to due process, etc., equal protection under law. Uh, maybe there's a question mark over that, given our, our law enforcement problems. And then very interestingly, it says uh, a country that uh, is el eligible must not engage in activities that undermine United States national security or foreign right, policy right, interests. Right. And that's really the, the, the crux here. Uh, there's mm. an explicit rule that says, you know, if, if you act in a way that doesn't really work for us in foreign policy terms, then you're not really eligible. And South yes. Africa's argued that it is non-aligned, you know, staying neutral, staying out of it. It's got its own position. Sure, that sounds good. But if you're at the same time uh, welf welcoming Russian ships into your harbors that are under sanctions, mm. if you're hosting... Your naval Russian harbor, I think. Your naval harbor, exactly, yes. Um, and you're engaging in, in naval exercises with Russia, and you're maybe supplying arms to Russia, and you're allowing military planes to land at your military air base, it does put a question mark over whether you are ne really neutral or not. Um, so right. I think the United States are right to be raising this and to be questioning it. And South Africa should really, the government really needs to pay attention uh, to what's going on here because this is building. It's becoming bigger, not smaller. Terence. Marius, do you think the government will pay attention to this or is that simply beyond our diplomatic news? Um, well, I think, you know, I think there are people in the ANC who are, know that this is quite a big problem. Uh, we had David Masondo in New York uh, three or four weeks ago. He was at the opening of an R&B office in New York. And, you know, the things he was saying was exactly what the president should be saying. Extremely, extremely measured, you know, saying that we are uh, great friends of the United States and, you know, it's not an ally we'd want to uh, alienate and so on. And I just think, you know, President Ramaphosa, I just don't think he has the testicular fortitude to push back against people because I'm sure the president knows that this is not great for South Africa, but there's the ANC, as we all know, is completely ideological cap, ideologically captured. And they often, they still, most, a lot of their politics is still actually straight from the 1960s. So they still think that uh, they support the Soviet Union in this great anti-imperialist battle against the evil United States, when we know that's uh, certainly not the case. And I think it's also, as John points out, the uh, bipartisanship of this is something to take note of. I think in uh, the United States, probably the only uh, area of policy where there's uh, a lot of uh, agreement uh, on issues between the Republican and Democratic parties is on uh, foreign policy. And we've seen that, yeah, there's not too much difference. Obviously, there's, you know, there's slight nuances and so on. But overall, the, the two parties generally agree more or less on what's uh, uh, policy what's happening abroad. So there's definitely something that South Africa should take note of. And uh, I'm open to correction on this, but I do believe South Africa, we actually were lucky to get into a go in the first place. I think mm -hmm. we are actually too rich to be in a go. So, and we only going to go because of this kind of uh, residual goodwill because of, uh, you know, the end of apartheid and, you know, Nelson Mandela and uh, all this, uh, you know, uh, cuddly feely kind of stuff that the United States felt towards South Africa and so on. And uh, we're running out of all that capital very quickly if we haven't already run out of it. And uh, we might actually be into overdraft now. So we need to make a plan to get it back. And, you know, sometimes the government surprises us and sometimes they do, they can wake up. And I think the government is open to listening. Not necessarily they'll do what they should do or they won't you know, actually listen to the advice. But we've seen with recent things, the, the government is, I think, starting to wake up to the scale of the crises facing South Africa, including this one. So maybe we'll get a surprise and uh, we'll get some retreats on South Africa's support for uh, Russia, with, and uh, you know, uh, with and having Russian ships coming to our naval harbors and so on. My my take on this, and we are heading uh, heading rapidly towards the end, is that while um, is that South Africa's inclusion in, in a go initially, and also uh, 
the uh, uh, manner in which the United States engaged with it, even though there were severe differences over um, over Iraq and Afghanistan and whatever, had a lot to do with the fact that uh, these issues were important to, to to the United States, but they weren't seen as sort of existential. I think what Ukraine uh, held up was the possibility of an actual shooting war with a major power, not not a sort of re you know a regional insurgency or something. And I think that 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 there is a sense that uh, they need to do that they need to thoroughly order to their who their friends and allies are. Um, South Africa could, um, uh, the South African government could uh, uh, get away with, if you like, um, uh, referring to the United States as carrying out a criminal war of aggression against uh, the people of Iraq, where um, it, where things like a possible uh, conflict with with a shooting war with China down, you know, uh, a couple of years down the road is not is no longer just a theoretical possibility. Um, this is something that that I think has 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 sharpened minds and hardened attitudes. And uh, yes, I think that uh, while we, you know, without saying that 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 South Africa needs to count out to anyone, it does need to think very very carefully about how, about how it, how it plays its um, how it plays its diplomacy. But I would say this: South Africa was caught completely unaware or completely unprepared for Russia's invasion of Ukraine, which is why they released a kind of knee-jerk statement and then had to, uh, had to retract it. I think that says a great deal about the quality of our, um, uh, of, of, of our, of our foreign engagement. With that, I think it's time. I think it's time to call it and send everyone back to um, uh, back to work and play. And uh, thank, uh, thank you all for joining us. And, We'll see you again tomorrow afternoon.